Gentlemen, good evening. I'm Alan Palmer. I'm the uh, executive director and the CEO of the National Atomic Testing Museum, the nation's 37th national museum. Can we all talk about that? And that's kind of a nice thing for our state because uh, you know the other the other 36 national museums are Smithsonian's. A couple, of, a handful of uh, service museums throughout the United States, and just four privately held museums in the entire country that are homes of national treasures, and this is one of those four uh, privately held. So we're really uh, proud of that. But there's a message in that: since it's privately held, it means it's nonprofit. So that's where we count on you to help us out. So thanks for being here tonight to do that. So tonight we've got a very special guest with us. Uh, Stan Friedman uh, is well known for a whole lot of things. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the things that stuck with me about Stan. Uh, he's a real nuclear physicist. And, and that's really something in today's world. There's a lot of accomplishment that goes with that. Uh, Stan started his career by getting his bachelor and his master's degrees uh, in physics from the University of Chicago uh, back in the 50s. That's a little while ago. I'm and proud so, of that. And, and so here he was as, as, as a young student right out of school with a master's degree in physics, right? That's pretty cool. So, but he had to go get a job somewhere. So for the next 14 years he worked in uh, defense industries and companies such as uh, General Motors, General Electric, uh, Westinghouse, TRW Systems, Aerojet General, and even McDonnell Douglas, uh, where he worked on a whole bunch of programs, including things like uh, nuclear aircraft, uh, fission and fusion rockets, uh, various compact nuclear power plants. Uh, and he tells me some of these were successful, but a lot of them were end up being canceled programs. Is that right, Stan? That's right. Almost all of them were canceled. <laughs> Well, but then he, then he, so here he is at a very high level, a nuclear physicist working with some of the greatest corporations in America. And what happens? In 1958, one day, he started liking UFOs. And so it became, for him, kind of a seminal, seminal moment, I think. Uh, and then since that, starting in 1967, he started lecturing around the country. Uh, and he's done that with over 600 colleges. 100 professional groups in uh, 50 U.S. states. Now the other seven that some people think exist don't count. <laughs> anyway, so he's, so, so he's authored over 90 different uh, papers uh, on UFOs. He's been a lecturer on TV, on radio, and documentaries. And I think it's safe to say that Stan is probably one of the best known UFO researchers in the country. One of the oldest ones, too. And because it goes back to 1950s, he, you know, he has that title. So he has, has certainly had a, a view of things related to UFOs that few people have. Uh, most notably was the fact that he was the first civilian researcher uh, at Roswell. And this was, of course, some years after the Roswell incident, but when they picked that up, Stan was one, the first guy on the ground as a civilian investigating Roswell. And since then, he's authored uh, quite a few books, which are available in the back. If you haven't bought one, I encourage you to do it. He is a very prolific author, a great lecturer, and it's a real pleasure to have Stan with us today. So Stan, uh, sir, the lectern is all yours. Thank you. Nicely done. This isn't the only time in my life when I've juxtaposed UFOs and nuclear, uh, but it's one of the few. And I'm delighted to be here. It's nice to know there's a place that honors the nucleus. I think that's what we're honoring here, aren't we? <laughs> nuclear testing technology. Uh, it's nice not to be swept under the rug. Some people don't want anything to do with anything nuclear, forgetting we're all radioactive. <laughs> And many of you have had treatments at hospitals that involve the use of radiation. But I'm especially pleased to be here because I admire Alan 
his courage in taking on what for some people would be an onerous task of trying to justify the existence of anything that honors nuclear stuff. Well, I'm proud to be part of the industry. I, I should have. <laughs> One of the more interesting lectures, opportunities I had was when I was working for Westinghouse on nuclear rockets. And I was in radiation shielding. And I had a call from a colleague at Los Alamos asking me to speak to the local section of the American Nuclear Society. I said, oh, I'd be delighted. I'd spoken to a number of technical groups. He says, no, I mean on an expense account, Stan. I said, well, I don't make those decisions. <laughs> I was working for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. He's talking about Los Alamos. I asked my management. They approved. I was officially on an expense account to go from Pittsburgh to Los Alamos to give a lecture entitled Flying the Saucers Are Real. We had over 500 people out, I think the biggest crowd they'd ever had at the time, and there were no negative questions. So it's kind of nice. And here in this town, I spoke to some people who were members of the American Nuclear Society as well. So I'm not a masochist. I am very pleased with the response I get. And in over 700 lectures, I've only had 11 hecklers. <coughs> and two of them were drunk. <laughs> and I'm told that you get more than that if you talk about sports, religion, or politics. <laughs> I don't talk about those things. Anyway. And I'm glad that Alan mentioned that I was not at Roswell in 1947. That was the year I was bar mitzvah. It was my 13th birthday in July of 1947. And I was not in Roswell. I'd never heard of Roswell. <laughs> I've heard a lot about it since. And I guess I have to push the button, don't I? Good idea, Stan. It's part of modern technology, modern journalism, it says here. One of the best uh, PhD theses done about UFOs tells about how rotten a job the journalistic community has done. Uh, there's two examples there. Nobody ever described an alien that looks like that lady with the nice lips, long nose, etc. That's a figment of the imagination. It was the biggest selling issue of that year until Princess Diane, incidentally. And popular mechanics didn't get it right either. Uh, but let's go back a little bit. Let me tell you how I got involved. Actually, it was twice. In the mid-70s, I heard a good story from a forest ranger in California. I was living in California about a sighting he'd had. And when we finished, he said, you really ought to talk to my mom. She had a great sighting in Albuquerque. His mother was Lydia Sleppy. Called her, talked to her. She had a very good sighting. And somehow it got mentioned that she was working at a radio station that their Roswell affiliate had called and wanted her to take dictation from a guy so they could put it on the newswire because the Roswell station didn't have connection to the newswire. And so he's dictating. She wasn't a journalist. She, she was in accounting, but she was a good typist. And suddenly a bell rings and a machine stops and there's a message that says, discontinue this transmission. And she says to the guy on the other end of the phone, what do I do? He says, stop. Now, some people may wonder, why in the heck would that happen? New Mexico had more classified effort going on there than any of the other states. Two of the three nuclear weapons labs were in New Mexico. That's where we were firing a captured German V-2s. That's where the first A-bomb was tested, Trinity site. If there was any place you were going to send spies, New Mexico was a good place, plenty of room to hide them in, one of the least densely populated of all the states. So OK, I talked to Lydia. She gave me some names. This is about 1974. I tracked down some of the people, and I really got nowhere. No, I don't remember that, and I'm not sure how much was truth or not, but you can only go so far. So I put it aside. 
And then in 1978, I was giving a lecture at Louisiana State University. And I was to be interviewed three times at a local television station, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And somebody from the university had brought me to the station. And I did the first two interviews, and the third journalist wasn't to be found. No cell phones back then. I know that's hard to realize, but there really weren't any. So the station manager, he's giving me coffee, he's looking at his watch, he knew the people who brought me there, he knew I had other things to do. And out of the blue he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And brilliant investigator that I am, I said, who's he? <laughs> his answer changed my life. He said, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. What? You know, where'd that come from? There was nobody else around. He wasn't cracking a joke or anything. He was hoping that the reporter would show up so they could do the interview. I said, well, what do you know about him? Well, we're old ham radio buddies. He lives in Homa. I didn't know where Homa was. I've been there since to talk to Jesse. Homa, Louisiana, H-O-U-M-A. We had to set up a UFO tour in <laughs> places like Homa. Uh, He's a good guy, you ought to talk to him. Reporter shows up, we did the interview, had a great response at the college that night, university. The next day I was at the airport early and decided, what the heck, let's see if we can find this Jesse Marcel. Called information, this is before the internet. There really was a day before the internet. And I got a number for Jesse A. Marcel, and I called and mentioned Bill Allen's name, and he told me his story. Now people have asked me, well, why did he talk to you? Well, Jesse was one of the few people that could hardly deny his involvement. I didn't find this out until later. But his picture was in newspapers, his name was all over the place. It was no secret that he was involved in the recovery of a crashed flying saucer, according to the articles. He's mentioned in that one. R-A-A-F, Roswell Army Airfield. If there's anybody from Australia, it is not Royal Australian Air Force, as somebody tried to tell me. Uh, captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. They like alliteration in the media business, I guess. And there's several articles, actually. No details of flying discs are revealed. There's a discussion about it. There's an article over here. It mentioned in articles around the world, Jesse was. I didn't know this at the time, as I said. So, okay, I got the story. He didn't know an exact date. I shared that with a colleague, William Moore. Uh, a few months later, I'm in Bemidji, Minnesota, everybody's favorite town. And after a lecture, somebody comes up to me and says, I ever hear anything about a crash saucer in New Mexico? And I said, well, yes. Uh, I wasn't going to tell him what I knew. Just uh, tell me more. Told me about a friend of him and his wife who had been around when a saucer was recovered in New Mexico. He didn't have an exact date, but he gave me the name of the niece of the guy who had told him this story. Bill had a third story, an English actor, Huey Green, when driving from Philadelphia, I mean from Los Angeles to Philadelphia, had heard on the radio a story about a crashed saucer in New Mexico. And he could pin down the date because it wasn't a trip you made very often. You can imagine what the roads were like. This was early July, 1947. So Bill went to the University of Minnesota library. He lived in Minnesota as a teacher. Started looking in early July, found the stories, which named lots of other people. I mean, key people. Uh, we spent the next year and a half tracking down those people, as many as we could. There were some that we couldn't, of course. And the first book came out in 1980. The Roswell Incident by William L. Moore and Charles Berlitz. And I got a cut of Bill's royalties. 
Burroughs' name was magic with publishers. Some of you may remember the Bermuda Triangle book. That was Charles. He was kind of unique. He spoke 30 languages. Worked as a spy on occasion because he had all the, the speech characteristics. You know, he could sound like somebody from any of those countries whose languages he spoke. You've heard of the Berlitz language schools. That was Charles' grandfather. His mother spoke one language to him when he was very young, his father another, his grandfather a third, and the nanny a fourth. <laughs> That's the way to learn languages, anyway. So, okay, we find there's 62 people. We kept up our research. By 1986, we'd found 92 people. And I instigated the Unsolved Mysteries program. Some of you may have seen that years ago. Uh, Leonard Nimoy hosted that at one time. And I convinced him to do a show about Roswell, and I was in it. Uh, it was seen by 28 million people the first time around. That's a huge audience because cable wasn't in yet. The second time it was run, it was 30 million people. And because I had instigated the program, they gave me access to a lot of those people who called in, my uncle told me about that, or my cousin, or, you know, stuff like that. So I finally put out my own book with uh, a fellow ufologist. In case you're wondering about that word, geologist, biologist, ufologist. You know, a scientist who studies UFOs. Yeah, makes sense. Let's see. Uh, some people will say, well, it only appeared, as a matter of fact, the man who's now a congressman uh, did a program with him, and he hadn't read any of the stuff that had been sent to him. Couldn't have been an important event, it only appeared in a Roswell paper. Well, I sent him front pages from about six different papers, including the Chicago Daily News, and the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, and the Sacramento Bee, and a whole bunch of others. But what do you expect from a congressman? I, I hope no congressman here, I think so. Uh, now, you need a little perspective here. The first sighting to get a lot of attention was by Kenneth Arnold. That was on June 24th, 1947, up near Mount Rainier in Washington State. And he saw nine objects which moved across the sky as a saucer would if you skipped it across the water. The media picked up on the saucer. He thought it was probably a secret government project. After all, we knew about the atomic bomb. What else was the government working on? He timed their flight from between that mountain and that mountain, knew the distance, someplace between 1,200 and 1,700 miles an hour. The speed record was under 700 at the time. He was careful not to use the higher number. People would think he was nuts. Daytime sighting, experienced pilot, etc. But in that few week period, there were hundreds of sightings. We found out later. There weren't any ufologists then. It was a curiosity. And some of the newspapers, of course, uh, sightings were seen in 47 states. Uh, Kansas, uh, Kansas wasn't one of them. After all, they, they're dry there. You know, only people who drink. Uh, what can I say? Uh, but the next day, you get all this fuss one day. Before the end of the day, actually, the cover story was out. I have one story that says, General empties Roswell saucer. It's in the same issue where they talk about the saucer, but General Roger Ramey headed the 8th Air Force, of which the military group at Roswell was a part. Now it's very important to recognize that what makes the story so significant is that the RAAF, the Roswell Army Airfield, was the home of the 509th Composite Bomb Group. They just happened to be the most elite military group in the entire world. Why? Because they were the only ones who had touched nuclear weapons. They dropped the two bombs on Japan. The next year they participated in Operation Crossroads, exploded two more bombs. Hand-picked officers, hand-picked men, high security, 
It's a very special group. That's important because the nasty, noisy negativists, as I describe them when I'm being polite, uh, don't want to tell you that, hey, these are special guys. They'll say, oh, the head of the group, uh, Colonel Blanchard, he was a loose cannon. They don't bother to tell you, oh, he went on to get four more promotions and was a four-star general and vice chief of staff of the United States Air Force when he died of a massive heart attack in the mid-60s at the Pentagon, incidentally. That's an important piece of information. He was not a loose cannon. At one time, he had thousands of nuclear weapons under his control. Uh, not somebody you want to mess with, and certainly not somebody who can be described as a loose cannon. Uh, the original article came out in 1948. I haven't told you, uh, 47, on July 8th. I haven't told you what happened yet, but I will. Uh, go back up a little bit. It was a rancher, Mac Brazel, a few days earlier. Heard a loud noise, didn't know what it was. Went out the next day to check on his sheep. And one of the big problems, of course, in ranching in New Mexico is there isn't much water around. Now, people here know about being where there isn't much water, but very important if you got animals that you, they have a clear path to the water hole water tank, whatever's going on, you have to find a way to get them water. So Mac goes out to check on his sheep and he comes across this area about three quarters of a mile long, about a quarter of a mile wide, strewn with pieces of very strange material, most of it a foil-like material, small pieces, peculiar characteristics, very strong, very lightweight, you could crumble it up and it would uncrumble on its own memory metal, except that wasn't part of what we knew we had at the time when you go back and check the records. So he goes into the store in the town of Corona, the nearest town. The ranch is out in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of nowhere in New Mexico, for any of you who've been there. There really is. Uh, there are still people who think that, oh, Area 51 is right next to Roswell, right? Well, it's about 600 miles. Not much in between, but about 600 miles. Okay, so he goes into the store in Corona where he did his weekly shopping. Corona's the small town closest. That's why my book is Crash at Corona, the definitive study of the Roswell incident. And they even had on their theater marquee, this theater was long gone, it's the 50th anniversary of Roswell, it said, forget about Roswell, it all happened here. They liked the title of my book. <laughs> anyway, uh, the rancher t tells the people about the stuff he found. Now, he didn't have a telephone, he didn't get a newspaper, he didn't have electricity. He wasn't listening to the radio to find an interesting story. And he explains he brought in some few pieces of this material. Who's going to clean up the mess out there? And somebody pointed out that there have been some articles, they did get newspapers, uh, which said there was a reward for pieces of one of these flying saucers. Maybe that's what he found. Why don't you go in the sheriff's office, Mac, Mac Brazel, and see if you can collect a reward. Well, Mac didn't have a lot of nickels to rub together. So on Sunday the 6th of July, he drove into Roswell, went to the sheriff's office. And the sheriff, by prearrangement, was to call the base about anything that might involve, it could be a, an accident where an airman was involved, could be somebody claiming somebody uh, was giving her a hard time, uh, whatever. Because Colonel Blanchard wanted to have a very good relationship with the town. Problem was a small town, 25,000 at the time. The base employed a few thousand. It was a major part of the community. It does have the world's largest mozzarella factory, incidentally, in case you're wondering. <laughs> I don't think they have tours, though, for some reason. They might have to give off samples. <laughs> give out samples. Anyway, the sheriff calls the base. The ba he talks to Major Jesse Marcel, the same Jesse Marcel that I had been told to talk to. And he talks to his boss, Colonel Blanchard. And Jesse goes into town, it's just a few miles and looks at this stuff and 
in our first conversation, he said there wasn't anything there that was conventional. Jesse had been in the Pacific, he'd seen plane crashes, and you normally find wire, vacuum tubes, tags saying made in Oshkosh. Uh, airplanes are pretty conventional sorts of things. He said there wasn't anything that I could identify. So he talks to Colonel Blanchard, who tells him to follow the rancher out to the ranch, it's about 80 miles, uh, and take their counterintelligence corps guy with them, Captain Cabot. Now why was that? Because Colonel Blanchard was worried about who's spying on them. They're a very good target for a spy, the only atomic bombing group in the world. And there's plenty of place to hide spies in New Mexico. So they follow him out, the rancher. They stay overnight in their sleeping bags. Next day, he takes them out to the debris field. They see all this stuff. And Jesse told me, he said, I figured it had to be a, a mid-air explosion for two reasons. It was spread over such a large area. And there was no crater. When an airplane crashes and it's got gas on board, you get a big hole in the ground most of the time. And there was no crater, and the stuff was spread out over this large area. So he was puzzled by that. They picked up a lot of stuff that they could fit in the cars, brought it back to town late at night on the 7th. He stops at his home, wakes up his 11-year-old son, Jesse Marcel Jr., who plays an important part in this drama because he went on to be a medical doctor, a colonel, a helicopter pilot, served in Afghanistan, Iraq, that area, flew 225 combat hours, a flight surgeon. But back then he was just a very bright 11 year old. And his dad's tell him, let's look at this record, see if we find any electronics or stuff. They built uh, ham radio stuff. And he remarked about how light the stuff was. Light as balsa. Every kid knew what balsa would. That's what you built models out of. You know, heavy as lead, light as balsa. That was the refrain. So Major Marcel goes into the base the next morning. And at their meeting, suddenly this has become classified. And he tells Jesse Jr. and his wife the, the next day, forget about it. Uh, two days later, Colonel Blanchard told Jesse to take one of our planes and carry that wreckage with you to our headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas, 8th Air Force headquarters. And don't talk about it. And that everybody did as instructed. This is the military, it's right after the war. When he gets to the base in Fort Worth, Texas, later became Carswell Army Airfield, and General Ramey, Blanchard's boss, tells him, I got this directly from him, you don't say anything, I'll take care of it. Is he gonna argue about it? Of course not. There's a chain of command here. There's a press conference, and the general came up with a good explanation. Just a radar reflector weather balloon combination. So this is story number two. First, it's a crash flying saucer. It's sort of generic term, flying saucer. It didn't use the word UFO. You didn't hear that until a couple of years later. And the press bought it, hook, line, and sinker. As I say, you got the cover-up story and the original story in the same article in some of the West Coast papers because of the time change. Now, the story didn't appear in a Washington Post or the New York Times because it went out too late because of the time change. Afternoon, New Mexico is pretty late back east, you know. So, within a day or so, the problem was solved. Had two explanations. Nobody was pursuing the matter. Really until I got involved. So, I have talked to Mac Brazel's son, who's alive. Oh, 
just so you'll know. Santa Fe, Albuquerque, White Sands Missile Range, biggest military base in the continental of 48 states. And the first nuclear bomb was tested here. And I'm leading a tour there in October. It's on my website. Great fun to be where the Trinity site is. See what's left of the buildings and stuff. You, you don't get irradiated, nothing to worry about. <laughs> well, it's, it's a national facility, so they have to open it to public access two days a year. <laughs> they get a good crowd at that time. Not far from Los Alamos, of course. Los Alamos, you can see, is east of uh, Santa Fe there. This picture hit the newspapers all over. It was taken in General Ramey's office. That's General Ramey right there. This is then Colonel Thomas Jefferson DuBose, his uh, chief of staff. And they're holding this crazy stuff on the floor. And of course, none of it was the original wreckage. I, I hate to say it, but they lied, flat out lied. They told Jesse, you don't say anything. Told the press, this is just what it was. And that is a radar reflector from a weather balloon. It isn't what was found. And we're all supposed to believe that Colonel Blanchard and Major Marcel, who had taken a course in radar and weather balloons and stuff like that, couldn't recognize a common garden variety neoprene weather balloon. This is the only atomic bombing group in the world. But those guys couldn't recognize it. People were pretty naive back then. I mean, some people still believe the government tells the truth, I guess, but uh, it's very interesting. If you look carefully, General Ramey is holding a piece of paper there. That's what it looks like, like with a good camera they use, not one of these uh, 10 megapixel cameras. <laughs> Speed graphic. Somebody has gone through a lot of trouble, Dr. David Rudiak, was able to read the words, and it talks about victims of the wreck. Now, since when does a weather balloon have a wreck and victims? But of course, that was years later that we read the effort. If somebody's really anxious to try to figure this out, they can contact me, I can get you a copy of that. <laughs> Uh, there's General DuBose with me. You can see it was taken a few years ago. You notice the color of my hair. <laughs> I was looking. I knew that Blanchard was dead. I knew that Ramey was dead. But I thought DuBose might be alive. So I contacted West Point because many of the officers still in the service after the war had been West Pointers. Blanchard had been, DuBose had been, and I called the Alumni Association. They said, yeah, he's still alive. OK, uh, in Florida. They didn't say where, but there aren't too many Thomas Jefferson DuBoses around. <laughs> I contacted him, called him. He was very pleasant. I was going down to Florida to visit my parents. Uh, stopped off to see General DuBose. Very friendly. Uh, his interview is one of 26, I think, first-hand witness testimonies on a video, a DVD, UFOs Are Real. And I interviewed him later on. I mean, very sharp guy. One of the things he said, he took the call from Ramey's boss, General McMullen. They knew each other. Crusty old guy, he tells me. Uh, he gave him three orders, also a West Pointer, incidentally. Send some of that wreckage up here today, Washington, with one of your colonel couriers. I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even to General Ramey. And I want you to get the press off our back, and I don't care how you do it. 
He told me that standing three feet from me. Now that's first-hand testimony about the action of a particular military officer. But something was cooking, obviously, and they thought it important enough to lie about it. A great guy, he took us to lunch at the finest place in uh, Orlando. I had a researcher check the papers over at Alamogordo next to White Sands Missile Range, and they found this article on the 10th of July. Fantasy of flying disc is explained here. All three of the pictures across the top have relate to this pseudo explanation. They showed a weather balloon radar reflector combination. Fantasy explained here. Newsmen watch Army radar crew launch. I can't even read that word. Disc, disc yeah. Occasionally, disc was used as opposed to flying saucer. Uh, so, was there a cover up? Of course, there was. No question about it. So, now we've got two explanations flying saucer, weather balloon radar. The Air Force, in its infinite wisdom, came up with two more. It took a lot of years, but I was rattling some feathers, I guess, ruffling some feathers. Oh, there's Major Marcel with some of this phony wreckage. When he came back, incidentally, he had to tell his wife and son, we never talk about this. See, it wasn't classified when they went out to the site, only after it went through this complicated business. And Jesse, being a good military family person, didn't talk about it. I think I'm the only one who was in both his home and his son's home. His son died last year, the medical doctor. Very special guy. He got shot down, incidentally, in a place that we never were, Cambodia. I mean, and managed to make it back. So he knows about covering things up. And when you're in the military, you do what you're told. People have asked me, well, why didn't they, they object to being told to lie? The colonel's going to tell a two-star general, no, I don't want to do that. He'd be in the brig, you know, in the next hour. And especially when they're both West Pointers. There's Jesse Jr., Dr. Marcel. He's four years younger than I am born. He was born in 1938. Great guy. That's what it looks like out there, just to give you some impression. Now, not too different from here, I must agree, but um, ain't a lot of trees around, folks. This is not back east. I grew up in New Jersey, and I live in New Brunswick, Canada. It's 92% covered with forests. You don't see a lot of forest there. <laughs> Hard to grow much there, unless you give it water. Well, then it was time, many years later, we were rocking the boat. A lot of us were making noise about Roswell. Some colleagues were finding lots of other witnesses. Uh, it was time for the Air Force to take preventative action, if you will. In other words, to lie some more. Explanation number three was super secret mogul balloons. The only thing secret was their purpose. You'd launch a collection of 20 standard conventional normal neoprene weather balloons hooked with twine at 20 foot intervals and with a few devices to measure the temperature and with the evil purpose of listening for a supposed or expected Soviet nuclear test. That's what was classified. Nothing about the balloon, the technology, none of that was classified. The balloons were left to lie out there in the desert. Ranchers would gather them in because they didn't want their sheep eating the darn things. 
And many balloons had a piece of paper on it, turn this in for a you know two dollar reward at the base kind of thing. But there was a big lie, highly classified. That was explanation number three. Mogul balloons. My favorite, of course, is explanation number four. Oh, this is what the wreckage looked like. Jesse put this together. There were these I-beam-like pieces with these purple, lavender, whatever you call it, strange symbols. He said it was sort of like hieroglyphics, but a bright guy, and he knew that there weren't any animals or birds or anything here, which hieroglyphics do have. If any of you has a piece of something like this in a drawer, contact me, please. <laughs> There's Colonel Blanchard. And people have described him as a loose cannon, a guy who went on to become a four-star general. And the noisy negativists never tell you that, of course. I think I have his uh, obituary from the New York Times. Yeah. Special uh, ceremony at uh, the Air Force Academy, which didn't exist when he got out of the military army at West Point. <laughs> Again, quite a guy. A very enviable record. Now we're ready for explanation number four. Well, this is number three. Fact versus fiction in the New Mexico desert. The Air Force supplied the fiction. That's the mogul balloon explanation. They lied about me in there, too, which I didn't much appreciate. But it's number four, that's the super special whopper. In, in the first report, they said they weren't going to say anything more about Roswell. There's no other case where they've written even one big report, no less two. But it was time for the 50th anniversary celebration. So they came up with explanation number four, my favorite. What we're dealing with here is crash test dummies. That's what they said. <coughs> the one in the middle is the dummy. <laughs> now, what's, what's crazy about this is, they published this picture. The man on the right is Colonel Madsen. I had no trouble finding him in the next trip when I was in New Mexico. I met with him for lunch in Albuquerque. He wasn't hard to find. And he told me. Look, the dummies did not look anything like aliens. The whole purpose of the test was, you know, you're flying airplanes very high, and you put a pilot out, eject them, and you, you want to know what happens. You don't try it with pilots first. So they had wooden crash test dummies, six feet tall, 175 pounds. And somehow these are supposed to morph into four foot tall guys with big heads. And you'll notice that the dummy is wearing flight gear. Not for pictures, but because you want to know what happens because of the drag of the air as the body is going down through the air. Does it maybe freeze to death? You know, does the drag tumble you all kinds of ways? And oh, there's another detail. The dummies being made out of wood, often the arms and legs fell off when they hit the ground. Now, I don't care what you think about people in New Mexico, I happen to be very fond of them, but they're surely not going to think a wooden dummy with a limb here and a limb there is really an alien. That's nonsense. But they got away with it. New York Times, front page above the fold on a Sunday. That's the best place you can have for a news article in the country. Now, none of these people, including the Air Force Colonel who wrote the report, talked to Colonel Madsen. Like I say, I had no trouble finding him. I mean, if his name was Smith, you could say, well, you know, it might be hard to find. But New Mexico, Madsen, no big deal. But this is the kind of stuff that gets you angry. That the press got taken in, that the public got taken in, 
He also had stories. He worked, Colonel Manson did it at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And he was doing work so classified, his boss didn't know what he was doing. He was some, some, giving to somebody else to work. And he was about ready to get a bad rating when the other guy stepped forward and said, uh, cool it. He, he and her and his wife worked there too, Wright Pat. They both have heard stories of bodies being at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He didn't go running to the media with that, but because I had taken the trouble to meet with them, he told me that. Okay, so my one of my first books, Crash at Corona, the definitive study of the Roswell incident. That's a little light, but what the heck, you expect that. I, there may still be a few copies back there. Now, Jesse Marcel Jr. wrote a book too with the help of his wife, Linda. I wrote the forward for the book and we have a few copies back there too. Uh, and so he came back from the war with PTSD. Can you imagine being sent over at age 68 and then flying 225 combat hours in a helicopter? I mean, I don't know whether somebody was trying to kill him. He was not the oldest guy there. There was a psychiatrist who was a year old. He wasn't flying combat missions. It's one of the reasons I have the greatest respect for Jesse. He didn't complain. Medical doctor. Otolaryngologist, I think is how you pronounce it. Ear, nose, and throat specialist, incidentally. Now, obvious question. Okay, so the government recovers the crashed flying saucer with bodies, as it happens a little distance away from the primary wreckage. They know they're not from here. What are they going to do about it? Well, there was direct precedent for what to do about it. You set together, put together a special team of highly specialized professional people. And the analog for that was the Manhattan Project to develop nuclear weapons, much of which work was done in New Mexico. Los Alamos, secret lab, thousands of scientists working there, including Nobel Prize winners working in secret, getting their mail at a post office box in Santa Fe. They know where to send wreckage. They know the smart guys, people who tell them what was going on here. Uh, the Manhattan Project was big, billions of dollars, and very classified. A good example of that, they had to figure out a way to separate uranium isotopes. So they built a little facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, a mile-long gaseous diffusion plant to enrich uranium. You start out with 7 tenths of 1% uranium-235, and you wind up with 90%. It was over a mile long, and it was using 5% of the electrical power produced in the United States. In secret, that's why it was in Tennessee, the TVA, cheap electricity. Oh, the government wouldn't cover anything up, would they? Of course they would. I don't, I'm not blaming them for covering that up. You don't tell your enemies what you're doing. And you can't tell your friends without telling your enemies. They read the newspapers too. You may have noticed that. So what did they do? Well, according to some documents we got in 1984, President Truman in 1947 set up a group called Operation Majestic 12. And he named the members of that group and their purpose was they were to be accountable only to the president and was to look into this flying saucer stuff. This is in September 1947, a few months after Roswell. This came in the form of a roll of film, no return address except the postmark was Albuquerque. This is a briefing document for the president-elect. Uh, President Eisenhower, D dated November 
18, 18 November 1952. The election had already been held, so Ike was the president-elect. He didn't become president until January of 53. This list of people in the group, it's an all-star cast. Some of you may know some of the names. Uh, for example, uh, James Forrestal had been the Secretary of Defense. Up there. General Nathan Twining went on to be the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. General Hoyt Vandenberg was just a step ahead of Twining. There were half a dozen scientists here. Hillencoder had been head of the CIA. Bush was the chief advisor to President Roosevelt and then Truman. No connection with uh, George W. or his son or whatever. Outstanding scientists, but there was one shocking name on the list. All of these guys had high level security clearances. We knew from their jobs. I mean, when you're head of the CIA, you've got to have a high level security clearance. Uh, and that exception was Dr. Donald Menzel, a Harvard University professor of astronomy. You don't need a high-level security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard or anyplace else. How could he be part of such a group when he had written three anti-UFO books? Took every opportunity to say it was all a bunch of nonsense. We were very wary of his name on this list. Somebody's trying to pull a fast one on us. But I ran across a reference to him in the document in the files of Dr. Bush, Dr. Vannevar Bush, from an attorney thanking Bush for clearing, helping clear Menzel of charges of disloyalty so that he would lose his security clearance. What security clearance? What do you need to, you know, this didn't make any sense. Well, I had to get permission from three different people. I went to Harvard after getting the permission, written permission, and looked at his files. And I'd seen his UFO correspondence, and it was not exciting, but there was a file, John F. Kennedy file. What's going on here? Well, it turned out, as I was looking at that, Kennedy had been on the Board of Overseers at Harvard, and his area of interest was astronomy, and he worked closely with Dr. Menzel. And they were on a first-name basis. And I found correspondence from Menzel to Kennedy saying, there's one area, this was at the time of the election in 1960, a little after that, one area where I may be able to be of some assistance. Uh, I had a longer continuous association with the National Security Agency. You know, the infamous NSA, never says anything, no such agency. When we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. That's what he's saying to the president. That tells you a lot. I don't know the documents are genuine. I got them at the archives. Somebody didn't go in for me. I found them myself. And wow, that changed everything. Because in his unpublished autobiography, I found he was a cryptographer code working. He learned Japanese to work on breaking the Japanese code. He taught cryptography. He did classified work for the CIA and the FBI and a dozen different industrial concerns. He was up to his shoulders in classified stuff right from the end of the war on. He'd been a Navy officer during the war. And he was head of the uh, Naval Reserve Unit in Cambridge, Mass. Classified stuff, naval communications, all that sort of stuff. So this changed everything. I hadn't liked the man. I'd had a run-in with him when I was speaking at Harvard. Called to, to invite him to my lecture. We'd never had any contact. I gave him my name. He says, oh, I know all about you. I said, oh, you saw my congressional testimony next to yours? No, I've seen memos and letters. You can't be a scientist and believe in flying saucers. I laughed. What else am I going to say to something like that? He got mad. You're not supposed to laugh at him. 
He started to rant, and I said, Dr. Menzel, I didn't call to argue with you. I called out of courtesy. I'm speaking at your campus. It was an engineering alumni group, so I had no idea whether there had been campus-wide publicity or not. I just called out of courtesy to invite you to my lecture. Oh, well, of course I'm not going. I told the story that night. Uh, some people said they could never have done that, but I, what am I got to lose? I'm my own boss. I don't need to worry about tenure or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. So I published an article, The Secret Life of Donald Menzel. <laughs> and people said, Stan, come on now. Menzel couldn't have been leading a secret life. He was a debunker. Look at the books he's written. Uh, there are three English guys you might have heard of, Burgess, Philby, and McLean. They were Russian spies working in MI5. You gotta lead a secret life to do that. You gotta be very careful what you do or don't say so nobody can trace anything back to where it came from. So, this invigorated my efforts and it only took me a few more years <laughs> to write a book finally, Top Secret Magic, M-A-J-I-C. And I've had, I've come across all the anti-MJ-12 arguments. And I think I've negated all of them. Usually by people who haven't done their research, but do their research by proclamation instead of by investigation. Another example of that, there were three memos. There, there are over a hundred items which are supposedly from MJ-12, Majestic 12. I think three of them are genuine. And I've given reasons why a bunch of them are phony. Details, details, details. Here's one I think is legitimate. It's a memo for Forrestal from President Truman. This memo. For our recent conversation, you are hereby authorized to proceed with all due speed and caution upon your undertaking. Hereafter, this matter shall be referred to only as Operation Majestic 12. It continues to be my feeling that any future considerations relative to the ultimate disposition of this matter should rest solely with the office of the President. Following appropriate discussions with yourself, Secretary of Defense Forrestal, Dr. Bush, and the Director of Central Intelligence, Harry Truman. Now, people said, oh, it's obviously a fraud stand. And I say, oh, not so obviously. I found somebody who worked for Truman the whole time he was at the White House. And I said, I didn't ask if it was genuine, because if he knew or didn't know, then we're running into trouble with security and stuff. Did you see any reason to think that these documents, including this one, or phony. No, he could find no reason to say that. See, that he could tell me. And we talked about the fact that, uh, for example, if you look at the date very carefully, it's offline a bit. And you notice there's a period after the date. Now, I don't about, know about you, but I don't ever put a period after the date. Van Bush's office did. And when I suggested that Bush might have written this, he said, well, of course, uh, Truman trusted him. Most of the things the president signs are written by other people. And he said, you noticed how offset it was just a little bit. He said, that's because we often put the appropriate data on later. You provide, provide the memo. And when you know the date, when it goes into effect, then you put the date on it. That didn't bother him at all. And so, uh, it is interesting that there was another one of the documents that drew the attention of the noisiest negativist of them all, Mr. Philip Class, Senior Avionics Editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology, no longer with us. This memo. This is an original carbon. Right kind of paper, it's got a watermark on it. It was in use by the White House at that time. And it's just mentioning 
NSC, National Security Council, MJ-12, Special Studies Project. And it's just saying that a meeting is going to take place at a slightly different time than originally. Not signed. That's about General Twine <laughs> mentioning it. And Mr. Klass, uh, in his infinite wisdom, perhaps you didn't notice it was done in the large pica type. Of course I'd noticed. I had lots of memos written by Truman, signed by him, and by others at the White House. Uh, he said, I got nine memos from the National Security Council and they're all done in the small elite type. This is pica type. I'll offer you $100 each for every genuine memo done in the same size and style type and meeting some other criteria, uh, up to a maximum of 10 that you can provide me within 60 days. He'd never been, I found out my checked again, never been to the Eisenhower Library. I'd spent weeks there. I was going there in a couple of weeks, so I went. Quickly found 14 memos done in the same size and style type and meeting all his criteria. Made copies, sent him copies with an invoice for $1,000. He said a maximum of 10. And he paid me. He didn't tell anybody about paying me, he told everybody about challenging me. Now, you can see that. There's Mr. Class. There's his check. Nice. Now, I'm a good guy. I took out some of the banking numbers. <laughs> he raised holy hell when I published this in one of my reports. <laughs> he was going to sue me. I finally said, look, Phil, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. I took the check to the bank. They cashed it. I can do whatever I darn please with that Xerox. And then he shut up. His father had been an attorney. You know, attorneys writing threatening letters, kind of thing. He thought he could bulldoze me. He should have known he couldn't, but. It is interesting that in his papers at the archives, the American Philosophical Society archives in Philadelphia, there is no Stanton Friedman file. We corresponded for 20 years. I wonder what he didn't want people to see. Probably his payment. Now here's the crazy part. <laughs> The Eisenhower Library, 250,000 pages of National Security Council materials. He had nine. Somehow we thought it could generalize from nine to 250,000. I think that's irrational, unbelievable. I mean, if he had 99 out of 100, there's one missing by number. Well, probably it was done the same size and style type if all the rest are the same. But from nine to 250,000, it simply doesn't compute. There were other challenges. Oh, some people objected. The briefing officer in that first page, which talks about the recovery of a crash saucer, uh, mentions Kenneth Arnold's sighting. Uh, the briefing officer said, it said Admiral Hillencoder. Oh, that's no good. He was not an admiral. He was only a rear admiral. Obviously, the documents are fraud. Well, I checked with a lot of people, including at the Eisenhower Library. I often use generic ranks. General instead of lieutenant general, major general, brigadier general, etc. Admiral for all three grades of admiral. And then I found a bunch of memos by Ike's staff secretary Brigadier General Andrew Goodpaster. He attended all the meetings at the White House and he wrote up notes later listing the attendees, including himself, General Goodpaster, signing it Brigadier General Goodpaster. And I could tell because I was at the Eisenhower Library the ranks of all the military guys. And practically none of them were four stars. I checked one of Ike's books, and he used generic ranks all the time. I asked two archivists independently, does it bother you that generic ranks were used? 
And they both said independently, no, of course not. It was standard practice. A lieutenant colonel can answer the phone, Colonel Jones. He can't sign it that way. Some of you were probably in the military, and you know what I'm talking about here. There's a difference between how you do things. There are certain rules. But it is not a strike against the document that it says Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencoder. There's Dr. Menzel. I wound up liking the guy. <laughs> I mean, he was dead already, of course, but still. <laughs> uh, he, did a, he contributed a heck of a lot to the military research and development, et cetera. Uh, and I wound up appreciating his contribution. His wife didn't know about it. I get people telling me, well, look, all those guys would have told their wives. I said, you've got to be kidding. I had a clearance for 14 years. I never told my wife anything classified. I can't control what she says when I'm not there, where she might inadvertently release something. And I'm sure some of you have had clearances, and you know what I mean when I say that you, you don't blab away to your spouse. Can get you in a lot of trouble, incidentally, if somebody finds out about it, too. Uh, so I wound up, as proof that his involvement in highly classified activities wasn't known, there were two issues of Sky and Telescope devoted to Donald Menzel. The year when he died, and the 100th anniversary of his birth. And neither one is there any word at all about all his classified work between World War II and when he died. Not a word. Can governments keep secrets? Of course they can. Now, I know that there's a famous astronomer, Dr. Tyson, who has said that the proof that governments can keep secrets is how much we know about President Clinton's genitalia. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. You know, it makes no sense. Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute, you know what S-E-T-I stands for? Silly effort to investigate based on a ridiculous presumption, which I'll get into in a minute. And Dr. Shostak said, well, the proof the government can't keep secrets is how bad a job FEMA did when Katrina happened, and how poorly the post office is run. Now, what do any of those have to do with keeping government secrets? There are some very large programs out there spending huge amounts of money I've had people say Roswell couldn't have happened because if it had, half the physicists in the colleges of the country would have been pulled out to work on it. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Thousands of scientists work for Los Alamos and for Oak Ridge and for Hanford and for Sandia Corporation and for Livermore. They didn't need to go to some college to pull out somebody who didn't have a clearance and probably wasn't as competent as the people at the labs. I worked in that business. Outstanding. Well, there are some academics who believe that all research gets done in academia. Who's kidding who? When I worked at GE on nuclear airplanes in 1958, we spent $100 million that year, and that was a lot of money in 1958. We employed 3,500 people full-time, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. And we never did fly a nuclear-powered airplane. That's just one of a whole bunch of programs, but there were a lot of sharp people there. I certainly learned a lot more from them than I did in my last year at university. You don't need to be in academia to do research. Look at Lockheed spent $10 billion on the stealth aircraft in secret. There's a real world and there's the imaginary world of the nasty, noisy negativists. Hail to the Dr. Menzel. Oh. <laughs> now, is there any proof that the government's covering anything up? <laughs> Well, this is just a typical example of a CIA top secret Umbra UFO document. And I think this one you can read eight words on. Not very exciting words. <laughs> USSR. Wow. Uh, 
And people say, well, Stan, why don't you just scrape off the black? Because they don't send you an original, they send you a Xerox. They're not stupid. <laughs> they may be nasty and so forth than venial, but they're not stupid. Uh, here's another one just to prove that there's more than one. There's my favorite. They couldn't find six words to declassify on this page. Deny in toto. It's funny. Now, here's my book about Majestic 12. And it's had a good response. The original documents are included. My identification of a number of them is phony and why I say that. Nobody's saying all the documents are genuine. Wouldn't it make sense if you were the government and good stuff gets out to put out garbage and hope some of it rubs off? Standard technique. So that your enemies can't tell you know, what's real and what isn't. Assume it's all junk. Because none of them are going to bother to go to the archives and stuff. That would be too much trouble. The people who complain about my talking about Menzel, not one of them. This shocked me, frankly. Went to Harvard to check. I included excerpts from the letters in my book. But you think they could have said, well, maybe there's other stuff there that says this is all baloney. They didn't. They just said he couldn't have led a double life, Menzel, among many other things that they complained about. I think there are still a few copies of these in the back. There's another one of my books. This covers the, the broad waterfront. Can you get here from there? Uh, opinion polls, science fiction, science, and UFOs. Some of the worst nonsense has been written by, hate to say it, Isaac Asimov, Arthur Clarke, Ben Bova. Uh, some of it is kind of absurd. I'm writing a paper now for the MUFON conference and reading back. Uh, Asimov said, if aliens were coming here, they'd either talk to us, making themselves known, or they'd hide. If they do neither, they're not coming here from elsewhere. He's an expert on alien behavior because he's written science fiction about <laughs> aliens. That's a neat way for knowing how the world works. Kind of a jump in logic. I also get into the press and UFOs, the technology you can get here from there, the five large-scale scientific studies that I've alluded to. Uh, they're out there, folks, if you want. And there have been a dozen PhD theses done. Most people are totally unaware of that. One of the best was on how bad a job the press has done. He was at Northwestern where Dr. J. Allen Hynek was, his PhD in journalism. And uh, how, how he could manage it, I don't know. He, he read over 10,000 clippings about UFOs years ago. That's a tough road, <laughs> having read a lot myself. There's Seth Shostak. We both appeared on the Q QE2, the Queen Elizabeth II, each giving three lectures. We got a free trip from England to New York, from UFO Magazine of England. Each attended the other's lectures. When I spoke, I mentioned the five large-scale scientific studies, talked about them, and then asked how many people here have read this after each one. And of course, he had read neither, none, <laughs> neither, none of the five. When we debated, on coast to coast radio. Some of you listen to coast to coast? Yeah, a few. Uh, we debated. I got 57% of the vote. He got 33%. 10% said, I don't know who won. Uh, he did admit, six months later, I think, I had called him afterwards, see if I could send him a copy of my book. Uh, the debate was on the radio, coast to coast. So I sent it to him, and he mentioned six months later that he had a copy of my book on his nightstand. He didn't say he read it. <laughs> now, I mentioned SETI and said, silly effort to investigate. Why do I say that? Because it's based on a ridiculous premise. Aliens are stuck at the level of our technology. Our first long-distance radio signal was received in 1901. Marconi. And they're stuck at that level? Techno 
technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future isn't an extrapolation of the past. I talked to a bunch of students at the University of Detroit, and I mentioned that in my lifetime, there are many examples of this. I said, look, when I started working in industry, I was using a slide rule. Looked around the audience, saw no reaction at all. Do any of you know what a slide rule is, I asked? Not one student, and that was from less than 45 years earlier. How many of you know what a slide rule is? You're older, see? The young people couldn't afford to come today, you know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I mean, that's an example. And why would they send us signals? You know, uh, we're bringing a party of 26 to have dinner ready, please. Dr. Jill Tarter of the SETI uh, movement said there might be some place that sending signals as close as a thousand light years. And when we make contact, they might help us solve our problems. Wait a minute now, a signal there takes a thousand years. A signal to get back, hey, what can we do for you guys? That's another thousand years. That's going to help us solve our problems? That makes no sense at all. They can't believe that somebody would come here without wanting to talk to them. What are they expert on that would be of interest? Motivation of societies? And you say, well, why don't they talk to us? Couple of facts. We earthlings, and I'm presuming you're all earthlings, I can't guarantee it, but we earthlings killed 50 million of our own kind in World War II. We destroyed 1,700 cities. This year, we will spend a trillion dollars on things military when kids die of preventable disease or starvation by large numbers. We're not nice guys. There were orders issued in 1952 to military pilots shoot them down if they don't land when instructed to do so. Now, how do you tell an alien, get your butt on the ground, buddy? You point down, you can imagine what he says in response. 52 is the biggest year in Blue Book history. I have talked to seven different people who quietly told me about being at military bases where pilots went up and never came back. In Frank Faschino's book, there's one copy back there, I guess. Uh, he lists 200 fatal military plane crashes between 52 and 56. 200. Five of the pilots had over 100 missions in Korea where there were MiG shooting at them. They survived that. They came back to the United States and they had a fatal crash. New York Times used words like disintegrated and disappeared. If I've heard seven stories like that, how many more are there? We're not being told the truth. I've talked to guys from Vietnam, good sightings over there. Talked to a lot of other guys. Sightings covered up. People can keep secrets. Governments can keep secrets. There's McMullen, I mentioned him. He was the guy who turned, uh, told uh, Colonel DuBose, you know, send wreckage up here today, get the press off our back, I don't care how you do it, and I don't want you ever to talk about it again. That's in order, do I need to put it in writing? No, sir. When a two-star general tells a colonel what to do, and they know each other, and they're both West Pointers, they do it. They don't argue about it. There we are, back to New Mexico. Yes, there's a cottage industry there. It's the biggest draw for people to go to New Mexico, to Roswell, as I'm sure you're all aware. And I'll be there in July, uh, giving a couple of lectures, being in a couple of panels. It's great fun. If you go, make sure you protect it against sunburn. It's, it's at over 3,500 feet, and it's dry. Good way to get cooked in a hurry. Anyway, let's see if we got, yeah, oh. 
Can governments keep secrets? Come on, Stan, of course they can. That's called jumbo. Somebody had the bright idea when we test our first atomic bomb that plutonium was awful expensive. Maybe we should test it inside this big cylinder so we won't lose it if it doesn't work right. They moved it from Ohio to New Mexico, White James Muscle Range, in secret. They had the good sense prevailed and they hung it up and it's still there. It got knocked down, but it didn't get destroyed. But if you can keep moving something like that monster across the country, then you know you can keep secrets about moving lots of stuff. Not an easy trip to move that from Ohio to New Mexico. Sappho Henderson, her husband was a pilot at the base. She told somebody that he had told her about flying some of the wreckage. If there was an article in the newspaper and he thought it meant it was declassified, it wasn't. I had to work hard to find her, but I did, and I found a few other people that he must have talked to, her husband, Pappy Henderson, including somebody, oh, sorry, somebody who was at Pappy's funeral and Pappy had told him at their military reunion uh, about this. Hadn't told anybody else, but there's this one close buddy. And a guy wrote a letter for me, and said, Colonel. And they used her on the Unsolved Mysteries program. She was totally believable. Uh, the Skeptical Inquirer, uh, the new UFO interest, scientific appraisals. Unfortunately, it wasn't very scientific. The chief investigator, uh, Joe Nickel, uh, had said about eight years earlier, when he and I were both being interviewed, I was in Roswell, he was in California, and he was asked, what do you think happened at Roswell? Oh, some PR guy made up a story to get attention. And I'm listening to this, I said, you don't know his name, do you? Well, no, everybody who's read any of the decent books about the story knows it was Walter Hout. His name's all over the place. I said, I knew him, I had dinner in his home, uh, he was not only the PR guy, he also had been a World War II bombardier and was chosen to drop the instrument package over one of those nuclear tests in 1946. And was close to Colonel Blanchard. If he had made up a story like this, he'd have been in the brig in two minutes. Remember, of course, he hadn't said this is the most elite military group in the world. I, of course, threw that in. Well, okay, eight years later, it's one of the stories he talks about here, and he still says the same darn thing. An anonymous PR guy put out an unauthorized story. It's a total lie. There's no simple, simpler way to put it. Especially when he'd been so informed. And if he'd read any of the books, he would have known it as well. Oh, that's one of the NSA UFO documents. Uh, and it's typical of 156 pages. You can read one sentence per page. Everything else is whited out. And I had people tell me, oh Stan, they've released their UFO stuff. I said, can you read underneath that whiteout? Well, no. Then they didn't release it. Is there a cover-up? You're darn right. I mean, I, I never found any of those sentences very exciting, frankly. There was a meeting in uh, Roswell, researchers and stuff. Jesse Marcel is on my left. Now, some of those people were phony, but Walter House, the tall one in the back, great reputation in the town of Roswell. Got community awards, highly trusted individual. I asked people about it, I made no bones about it. Just briefly on the Betty and Barney Hill case, entirely different case, but there's a reason for bringing this up. That's Betty and Barney, it happened in 1961. They saw a UFO, they lost two hours, they didn't feel so well a couple of years later, they went to doctors, finally one of the doctors says to Barney, who was having an ulcer that acted up, can't do any more for you, Barney, I think you better go see a psychiatrist. 
They wound up with Dr. Benjamin Simon, the world's expert on PTSD. They call it shell shock war veteran syndrome back then, but post-traumatic stress disorder. They were each independently hypnotized to relive a portion of their experience. It was taped. Uh, a very exciting story. There's a book captured that deals with it. They were driving in New Hampshire. They saw the UFO. It came down. There's some strange noises. They got home two hours later than they should have gotten home. There's a missing period of time. And under hypnosis, two years later, they each independently relived the same experience of that craft having landed, of them being taken on board against their will by these little guys, kept in separate rooms, examined, treated as specimens, a sort of catch and release program, if you will. It was not pleasant for them. They didn't know they were ever going to come back, what's going on. Nobody's, they were being treated as specimens. One of the exciting things was Betty, under hypnosis, relives how she asked where they're from. I know you're not from around here, understatement of the year. Uh, they showed her a, a star map, if you will. She was after she could, re, she could draw it later on accurately. She said, yes, she did. It's in the book. And a brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish did something nobody else had ever done, was able to figure out what the stars were in this map. That's a very truncated version of the story. But there's an important reason for mentioning it. Many people will say to me, now Stan, you're saying that an interstellar vehicle, probably an intergalactic vehicle, flew all the way here and just happened to crash near Roswell. Come on. I said, that's not what I'm saying. I have pushed for a long time for the fact that we have a two-stage system, just as the Navy does. They're aircraft carriers. Big nuclear-powered ones can operate for 18 years without refueling. 18 years. They carry 75 little airplanes that can operate for what? Two hours without refueling? But they don't work worth a darn on the water, and a carrier certainly doesn't fly. Between the stars, you've got a mothership. When you're in the atmosphere, it's an entirely different technological problem. You have your little Earth excursion modules. That's the way we do it. There's no big secret there. I don't think what crashed was a mothership. We have reports of things that are almost a mile long. That's not what crashed. There are 5,000 physical trace cases from 80 countries. People see small things under 100 feet in diameter. One six of those reports involve reports of beings associated with the craft, incidentally. I wish Ted Phillips would write a book, but he still hasn't. Uh, so, do I say that this came here from another galaxy? Of course not. Next big galaxy is two million light years away. The star map tells us these guys come from Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli 39.3 light years away. Just down the street. They're also a cool billion years older than the sun and they're only an eighth of a light year apart, 30 times closer to each other than the sun is to the nearest star. Around the boondocks. They're 39.3 light years from here. Within 54 light years of here, there are 1,000 stars. Within 1,000 light years, there are 8 million stars. Why would I ever suggest that anybody's coming from another galaxy? If my wife wants a loaf of bread for dinner, I don't say, oh, I'll be back next week, honey. There's a great bakery in Sydney, Australia. <laughs> She says the supermarket's a mile and a half away and we need it for dinner. Not next week. Besides, you can't afford to fly down there anyway. <laughs> there are still copies of the book, I think. It's an exciting story. And it, it's been optioned for a movie as has Top Secret Magic. Now, when it comes to Hollywood, you never know. Options come and go. The, the option's been renewed. That's a good step in the right direction. Anybody want to finance a movie? I know where you can invest your money. No guarantee. There's Marjorie Fish, the woman who built the models that tell us where they came from. You can see how long ago this was, too. She was also a sculptress, member of Mensa. Brilliant woman. She died last year. Uh, 
really respected her. There's one of her models. How'd you like to copy out all the numbers that show the location of each of those uh, stars, beads? In my movie, UFOs Are Real, we have testimony from the head of the astronomy department at Ohio State University saying how accurate she was in the model she built. They use them as teaching tool at OSU. This gives the names, and again, the two base stars, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli. It's the constellation of reticulum. That means the net in Latin. So don't tell me about other galaxies. I don't care. Got enough trouble in this neighborhood. There's General Twining. Pretty special guy. He was a member of MJ-12. I've talked to his daughter and both his sons. Talked to members of all the families, except one, the one named Smith. Hardest ones to find. Oh, just for kicks, this is what a nuclear-powered airplane would look like. You don't have this picture around here, I don't think. We do now. <laughs> <laughs> the reactor's in the middle. Kind of an incredible achievement if we did operate jet engines on nuclear power. The exhaust temperature from the reactor would be over 1,800 degrees. This would fly for thousands of hours and replace the crew, but you keep, you know, kind of neat. This is what we spent $100 million on in 1958. There's a nuclear rocket engine. I think you have this picture around here someplace. Uh, it's in the middle. Excuse me. Uh, power level of this little BSD when I worked for Westinghouse was 1,100 megawatts. That's half the power of Grand Coulee Dam. This bit. And it worked the maximum time it could operate it because you'd need liquid hydrogen. The, the exhaust temperature is only 4,400 degrees or so. Quite an achievement in 1968. Of course, then they canceled the program. What do you expect? I think you have this picture or one like it. This is from one of the Phoebus reactors. Area 51's over there. Oh, I love this. This is one of those nuclear power carriers. E equals MC squared times 40. 18 years without refueling. This is real. This is not science fiction. And one final point. The major source of energy in the universe is nuclear fusion. That's what goes on in all the stars. It's not burning gas, it's nuclear fusion everywhere. What difference does it make? Because you can use it for propulsion. I worked on a study of fusion propulsion in 1962. Kick particles about out the back end that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. 10 million times. The aliens know we can get out there if we want to spend the money. And if I were an alien, I'd be concerned about us. Primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare. I don't think the Galactic Federation would allow us to join. I don't think we're qualified. But, oh, the, uh, the mushroom cloud was only three miles wide on that first H-bomb test, 1952. We figured it out in 1938. First fission bomb, 1945. First fusion bomb, 1952. 10 million tons of TNT equivalent, peanuts. Russians tested one, it was 57 million tons. If that doesn't scare you, it sure as heck scares me. Put it in the middle of New Jersey, it'd have fires from Philadelphia to New York. Now, having grown up in New Jersey, some people might say that's not a bad idea, but we don't want to go there. Enrico Fermi, people incorrectly state that he said that there's nobody coming here. No, he asked a question. That's one of the reasons I went to the University of Chicago. He was famous for using questions as teaching tools. Where is everybody after they discussed that it wouldn't take more than a million or two years to colonize the galaxy? 
And I think the best answer is we don't know where everybody is. We know that some of them are coming here, and we know the government knows a heck of a lot more than they're telling us. That's a reasonable answer as far as I'm concerned. He was a scientist scientist. You can't believe what other professors said about him when he died. I was there when he died. Uh, the Fermi paradox means why aren't we spending more time looking into this? That's my interpretation. Just to throw a picture of a UFO, this is from Trindade in Brazil. A daytime released to the public by the president of Brazil. There's Blue Book Special Report 14, biggest study ever done. Here's one of the lies by the Secretary of Defense. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been obtained. That's what the Secretary of the Air Force said. The data shows the unknowns were 21.5%. That's not a round off of three. In addition, we got the category next to the bottom one, insufficient information. By definition, if there wasn't enough data, the sighting was not listed as an unknown. Not one press story I've been able to find corrected this nonsense. And similar statements are still being made. Be nice if we got the truth. Oh, I gotta show you the cartoon. This appeared in the New Brunswick newspaper. This was after I'd been elected to the Roswell UFO Hall of Fame. It's always nice to be recognized by your peers. <laughs> I couldn't resist. There's some of the books. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Do you want me to take some questions? Absolutely, Stan, please do. There's a hand. Can you elaborate on the crash because there were two vehicles involved that bounced off of each other? Well, I'm, that's my theory. That the ones in that second crash, when they hit, one went this way, one went that way. And I talked to an Air Force pilot, retired, and he says normally you don't get the same damage to one, to both. One makes it and the other one doesn't. Yes, one came down over here, one came, exploded over here, yes. And the details are in the books, there's a lot of detail. Uh, and actually there was a crash in uh, Aztec, New Mexico a few months later. Uh, a lot of them crash. I mean, we all know we never lose an airliner, do we? <laughs> couldn't, couldn't resist that, but yes. What's your take on the Santilli uh, bill? I was in the uh, Fox Network program about Ray Santilli, alien autopsy, I guess, what did he call it, something like that. Uh, and I met with him twice in England. And half the stuff he told me was clearly untrue. So I have no reason for accepting it as true. Uh, a lot of detail, but that was wrong. Why do you, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Flying planes that are nuclear and doing things like that, I've always been told my whole life that the reason we don't do it is it's dangerous, it can crash. That you, that's why we don't have rockets going up with all the nuclear you know, uh, reactors and stuff on them that can launch better. Is that true since you're a nuclear physicist? Is it really that dangerous uh, to fly a nuclear planes, or is that really just a bullshit thing that's been told? So I, I, I think you can make almost anything safe if you work at it. <laughs> Now, I would never have guts enough to get on a high-performance airplane. How fast did they go, Mach 2? Better than that. Okay, better than Mach 2. Now, that's a lot of energy with the guy up in front of that. Was it safe? Well, he expected to come back, and he did. Were there people who died flying airplanes? Yes. Look at the Apollo mission. Three guys died on the pad. I'm not saying these are risk-free things. But I think the war is dangerous. If you've got a war machine, it'd be nice if you could use it to full advantage. You realize during World War II, a submarine could stay underwater for about 
24 hours. Needed air for the diesel engines, had it go up. Nuclear powered submarines go around the world underwater. Russians don't know where our retaliatory missiles are. Kind of afraid when you don't know where the other guy's good stuff is. So it's a trade off. I think nuclear airplanes could be made safe. The nuclear rocket, incidentally, was not going to be used from the launch pad. It's an upper stage. Triple the payload to Mars. That's kind of exciting. Why are we doing it? Costs money, and there's no leadership. Two simple answers. I worked on a bunch of programs that needed an Admiral Rickover. He put together the nuclear navy. But NASA didn't provide the leadership. And is anybody here from NASA? I'll say it again. They didn't provide the leadership. I thought we'd have a base on the moon by now, by the end of the century. Everybody I worked with thought so. No go? Yeah? Can you elaborate more on some of the cases you were talking about where planes just disappear or disintegrate? Well, okay. Uh, a guy was at a base where the word went out. Well, maybe the best case is from somebody who didn't disappear. Uh, he was on duty, Navy fighter. Uh, he was scrambled late at night in near South Carolina. He was directed by the controller where the object was. He went up. He gets up to 20,000 feet. You know, where is it? The guy's watching radar on the ground, so he knows where things are. Well, he's coming up at you right now. Okay, object comes up, heads toward him, shines a bright light, he held his hand up. Pilots don't like bright lights in their eyes at night. Fair enough. Uh, you can see the bones in his hands. And what's he going to do? He's going to pull the trigger. It's a hostile action. Nothing happens. The guns hadn't been loaded. He's talking to the, the radar guy all this time. Thing went by him. And he's talking to them, and when he comes down, he's got two suits and two guys in uniform talking to him for a couple of hours about what happened. It's clear that they had heard a similar story. I've talked to this guy. He went on to be a lawyer. We agreed the only reason he was still alive was that the guns hadn't been loaded. Now, another case of uh, Cuba. Cuban MiG case. One of our listening posts picks up a UFO heading southwest, generally toward Cuba, and they're listening to the Cuban Air Defense Command, which is mostly operated by the Russians. And they spot these un this unknown, and they launch two jets. They head toward it. What should we do? The decisions are made on the ground with the Russians. Shoot it down. So the first plane says it's got a, the radar is locked on, ready to aim, and suddenly it's complaint from the a comment from the guy, the, the the wingman. The first plane just splattered all over the place. Our guys are listening to this. Boca Chica, Florida. Uh, they send in a report, and I'm hearing this from one of the guys who was at the listening post. Nobody else around him is telling me the story. He'd heard me lecture, and I guess he decided he had to tell somebody. And uh, they get a request from NSA, send the original tape. He said, that was very unusual. I said, well, do you think they could have learned something by going over that brief moment from I have a lock on, ready to fire, and zappo? He said, I don't know. All I know is that's what happened. And so that's two rather different cases. But they seem to take defensive action. If you hear, find out that the other guy's missile lock on radar is on, you're going to say splat. <laughs> it's the only sensible thing to do. Nobody wants to be hit by a missile. They're not being nasty, they're just being sensibly defensive.
So those are two cases. You don't find these in the open scientific literature, to say the least. Yes, sir. Could you please comment, going back to Justin 12, James Forstall, and uh, his strange death. His strange death. Uh, his so-called depression falling out out of an open window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Supposedly, you sound like a very hokey supposedly, story. Supposedly, actually being witness to a survivor of one of those well, crashes, and uh, that supposedly I'm not sure of. Right. There are several different explanations. He ran through the hall saying the Russians are coming. Another one says he said the aliens are coming. Another one says he said the Martians are coming. We don't know that any of those stories are true. We do know this: his friends were worried about him for months before that happened. So much so that they sent him to the, uh, oh, what's the big mental clinic? No, not, well, later he went to Bethesda, but before that, in Kansas someplace, there's a Menninger Clinic, right, right. And he stayed at the place in Florida that a, a rich friend of his owned. They were very concerned. Part of the problem was he had submitted his resignation, as you do at the end of the the president's term, and it was accepted, which surprised him. But he was having troubles. There's no question at all that he was having mental problems before that. That's why he was sent to Bethesda. By friends who cared about him. This wasn't nasty punishment. So what all went on, I don't know. I did talk to one of his sons, and I, I got permission to see his files at uh, Firestone Library in uh, New Jersey, Princeton. And I still didn't learn anything more. His wife was had a drinking, serious drinking problem at that time. You know, I, I'm not going to psychoanalyze the man. He was a patriot. I say that because you can't believe how much work he accomplished during World War II. He got those ships built. Not an easy job during the war when everybody wants materials for airplanes, for ships, for you name it. So I have a great deal of respect for his record. But I'm not going to jump off the, loose, the far end and say, well, it's because he knew about aliens. He, I'm sure he did know about aliens. He was a member of MJ-12. Of course he knew. But that was only a contributing factor, I believe. If anybody knows, you know, you know, a grandson who got the real story from hidden letters or something, I'd love to hear about it. But I'm not expecting to find much like that. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, the NSA is in some of this stuff here. Uh, anything about Eric Snowden releasing anything on the UFOs? Eric Snowden, the NSA, and UFOs. Yes, actually. He did release some material in which it was indicated that they talked about putting out disinformation and showed some pictures of UFOs. What this all means, we don't know. One good thing about Snowden is that I, I used to have to explain to people that NSA didn't just mean never says anything or no such agency. Now everybody knows about the NSA. And I do disapprove of some of the things they've done. But that's a matter of choice, I guess. Uh, you know, when you, don't, when you have unlimited power, sometimes you get away with doing things you shouldn't do. And there's nobody watching the store, in other words. Who's speaking for the public? And something I didn't mention, just to give you something else to think about along the same lines. There was a memo put out by, the, by a man named Carol Bolander, an Air Force general, who was asked, what should we do about Project Blue Book in 1969 after the University of Colorado study said we should close it? He was asked, had no previous connection with it, Worked on the lunar excursion module, was a darn good engineer. He wrote a memo, which we didn't get until 10 years later, in which he said reports of UFOs which could affect national security are not part of the Blue Book system. They're investigated using, uh, now I forget the number of the report, a, a particular regulation or Air Force Manual 55-11, but are not part of the Blue Book system. That's an extraordinary statement. Now, two paragraphs later, he says, 
if we close Project Blue Book, which was closed as a result of this memo, the public won't have a place to report UFO sightings. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated and use of the procedures designed for that purpose. Extraordinary statement when the Air Force every year since then has said we have no interest in UFOs, we're not investigating any sightings. I managed to locate him, another one of those names that it makes it easier to find somebody, and I told him, I said, it sounds like you're saying there were two separate channels of information. The ones that could affect national security, such as, for example, and I use this example, a UFO going down the runway at a strategic air command base where nuclear weapons were stored. That's a matter of national security by definition. Or if my wife and I go out at the end of the driveway and see a saucer go overhead, no big deal. He agreed with that. He's dead now, unfortunately. But no major news media group has followed up on that. I've talked about it in a lot of places. I've got copies of the memo. There's no question where they came from. I don't know of anybody else who talked to him. But think about that. Reports which could affect national security are not part of the Blue Book system. That's a story. Yes? What are your thoughts on that crash in Kecksburg? Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. Well, I've known Stan Gordon, the chief investigator on that case. Half the town saw this wreckage being taken away on an Air Force, on a big truck and stuff. He's a very good investigator. Apparently, the scene, with, this thing was in over a large area, came in, crashed in the woods in Kecksburg. Military came, grabbed it. Some people in town saw it, and away it went. I think Stan did a great job, and I think it's an excellent case. And Leslie King, a darn good reporter, wrote an excellent book. Uh, they put a Freedom of Information Act request through NASA, which the Air Force referred them to, believe it or not. And they never really got any satisfaction out of the suit. Uh, I think it was a genuine case. As I say, I've known uh, Stan since the 60s. I lived in Pittsburgh for three years. So, good case. Excellent. Yes? Did you ever have a sighting? Did I ever have a sighting? Nope. I never saw a neutron or a gamma ray either. <laughs> They're real too. <laughs> yes? <laughs> the man over there, yes. Oh, okay. uh, two questions, actually. I've always, I've always been curious as to why, on the Roswell case, uh, Colonel Blanchard put out a press release that was a flying saucer. That's the first question. Second question, I've always been curious why the aliens didn't come and pick up their guys. Two good questions. I think he put out a press release because he was instructed from on high to put it out, and we can deny it. He was suddenly unavailable for discussion. All the attention switched to General Ramey, who carried the ball, Blanchard's boss. Uh, and several people have raised the objection, hey, we never leave any, is it the Marines that say we don't leave, no, the SEALs, we don't leave anybody behind? Uh, the military says they don't leave anybody behind. Uh, we know that there were a lot of sightings in the area after that. Whether they were looking for their downed guy or they didn't give a darn, I have no idea. They may have been looking for them, but once they've been taken into custody, what are you going to do, storm the gate? My, my thought was, you know where your people are. Supposedly, when they go down, don't you go out and get them as quickly as you can? Well, they may, or may have been nobody close enough to come down and they certainly knew that they were in an area where there was all kinds of military activity. This is not innocent Bill around there. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Two more? Yeah, we're going to Okay. Yes. As the youngest one here, I probably have three questions. Louder and quicker. Um, one is, were you ever encountered by the men in black? Two. Have you ever um, known what ha really happened at the Battle of Los Angeles? And three, wasn't there a guy who was authorized to release stuff from Majestic 12? From what? Majestic 12. A guy authorized to release stuff from yeah. Majestic 12? Yeah, he had authorization. I guess my answer is, as far as I know, no, no, no. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know if anybody was authorized to release stuff, but all kinds of people telling stories. Uh, what was the second question? Men in Black. Oh, Men in Black. No, I've never encountered Men in Black. No, they can actually see them right in here. <laughs> good point. How about the Battle of Los Angeles? Oh, the Battle of Los Angeles. It's a good story. Something happened. We were shooting shells at something. I mean, the West Coast was pretty darn concerned. And they got the searchlights, you've seen the picture, there's a thing up there, we didn't seem to do any damage to it. I don't know what went on there. Pays your money and takes your choice. General Marshall was concerned, and if there was a highly respected American, I don't know of anybody more respected than General George C. Marshall was, Chief of Staff all during the war. One more question. Are you familiar with the crash of needles in California that just happened a few years back? I've heard the expression, and I've been through needles, but I'm not really familiar with it. You find it exciting? Well, they had a crew come out, and they were cleaning up something, and they were a radiation team. And I was wondering if maybe they were working still with nuclear power, you know, in the military without letting us know. Because George Knapp went out there and actually interviewed some of these guys that were running around town in trucks. And the whole town saw this thing crash. It was a, it was a uh, turquoise blue fly over the mountain and crash behind a mountain. And they flew in within 15 minutes to clean this wreckage up. And I was wondering, with somebody with your background, and you're so good at investigating this stuff, it might be something that's recent, that's reminiscent to Roswell, and I thought I wanted to get your thoughts on it. I don't really know enough about it to have a thought. I'll talk to George about it. Awesome. I don't know anybody better equipped than George. There's an investigator. <laughs> you guys are lucky, those of you who live here, to have somebody like George. Thank you. I think we're about done then. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sam, thank you again so much for coming tonight. Uh, for those of you who have a few more minutes, we'll be back in the back doing some book signings. Uh, but I would mention that uh, two things. Stan uh, was on the museum's radio show, which airs on Saturday nights at 6 to 7 o'clock, and we're going to be on tomorrow night uh, with David Marler talking about Triangle UFOs. So uh, this discussion continues on the subject, and we'll have Stan back at a future time and maybe do some more on the radio show, and unless I can talk him into coming back to Las Vegas again. So well, it's a hard thing. place, but... <laughs> So, thank you for being out tonight, and thanks for supporting the museum. We really need your help. And as I mentioned, the men in black, you can find them in our renovated Area 51 exhibit. Thanks for coming out.